So today I have a real pleasure to introduce two distinguished speakers, Mr. Ed Perea from the Squamish tribe. He is a master basket maker, and here I think we have some of the baskets that he has woven. And um, Dr. Dale Crow from Washington State University. Dale and I share a common friend, a wetland archaeologist, Akira Matsui, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. But Akira did a lot for wetland archaeology, who introduced me to Dale, and Dale introduced me to Ed. So um, in the spring of 2016, both of them came to Japan. Uh, and we went to two Ainu uh, places, one in Shiraoi and the other in Nibutani. And at Shiraoi, um, we gave a small workshop where Ed said, weaving basket is not just weaving techniques. 80% of the work is ready to get the raw materials. Mm -hmm. and getting the raw materials starts with planting trees in the forest, which I think was really the highlight of our trip and highlight of my stay in Japan for two years when I was doing a big project with an institution in Kyoto. And I'm very, very excited to have this opportunity to have them here. They're also giving a class lecture tomorrow morning at 9.30 in my hunter-gatherer archaeology class in 136 barrels. So if um, any of you are interested in coming to that one as well, please um, do come. It's 136 barrels. So without further introduction, please welcome Ed and Beth. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. It's uh, interesting traveling all the way down here and uh, seeing this uh, beautiful university here. My my first time in this in this area. So uh, we got uh, our little slideshow here, and we'll. Uh, uh, I brought baskets and things that pertain to uh, uh, food gathering, fishing, uh, gathering type uh, type baskets to show and tell. And so, our uh, our our first uh, slide there, our archaeology basket. Uh, it's a it's a backpack type. Uh, you uh, you wear it on the on the forehead and and carry it on the back like that. Uh, and of course, this is a. It's gonna slip in here. Yeah, I got my own basket. <laughs> this is a, a this is a small sample. The the larger ones they fit across the back and down. Sure, uh, and they uh, they would carry f uh, foods like this. This is a piece of uh, hard smoked salmon, uh, uh, half of a, and it's uh, flayed out, and then the little uh, cedar sticks are put through there, and then it hangs in the in the smokehouse for about three or four days. And this is a, a common food that they would carry in one of these, uh, uh, distribute in one of these uh, uh, burden type uh, baskets. But when I wove this one, I, rather than weaving four baskets, I've got uh, four in one. I got a 4,500 year weave here, a 3,000, a 2,000, and a 1,000 and above. So I. So I wove uh, all in one basket <laughs> rather than having to weave four baskets. So uh, you uh, you folks can can pass this basket around and, and take a quick look at it. And, uh, and one basket that represents 225 generations, uh, no doubt a relative of it. Can you 
Pass this around. And, oh yeah, and then you can look at this. But this uh, is our lunch, so please. I told I told oh, Dale this is his lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> So we just came out with a, a book that um, is out on, on, on these, this three-year project, and we can pass one around of that. And uh, it's uh, essentially uh, through the Journal of Northwest Anthropology, uh, the society bought a bunch, so we could sell some for uh, $40. They, they actually sell on Amazon. For fifty four ninety five and, this, and we'll uh, sign it. So this covers <laughs> but we need a check or a cash reporting. This covers my life as a basket weaver and Dale's life as an archaeologist and the two of us coming together and replicating ancient Salish Sea basketry like the one I'm passing around there. So Does this uh, energy a culture and, and Separately, it's, uh, and have nearly the, the completeness one, as bringing cultural training and science. One fellow commented on the book, and he said, "It's a it's a human interest book." <laughs> and yeah, our oh, I thought that was Secretary of State Ralph Monroe, the Pat Kirch knows, and he he uh, he said, "This isn't a site report. This isn't a museum catalog. This is a human story." So we hope you see it that way. <laughs> The Burke Museum's been very supportive. This is Ed working on some of the replicas of the 2,000-year-old baskets they have at the UW Burke Museum. Our, this is a wet site that was close to my area where I live on, on the Snoqualmie River. It was a 2,000-year uh, dated back. Uh, it was a, a, a food-preparing uh, village right on the edge of the river, and all these baskets were thrown down near the river and got, got this mud on them that preserved them. The Snoqualmie River has a fine, fine uh, silt in it uh, from the glaciers, uh, from the Cascade Mountains, uh, powdered rock. And once that powdered rock gets on a piece of wood or something, it seals off all that oxygen and it's preserved forever. So all these baskets were preserved down there. Ed uses a, a form to weave around to keep it perfectly formed. He uses this styrofoam from the Suquamish Casino construction. They have this wonderful styrofoam. And at the Ozette ancient site, they use bent wood boxes to weave around. You can't weave these baskets in a plating, you can't weave them without uh, a form. So this, this, oh. these are better for sticking needles. This, this little one here uh, was the only one they found where the whole basket was there. The bottom, the side wall, the rim detail. So I was able to measure it and, and replicate it uh, and uh, use the, the cedar root that it was made out of the cedar root was identified underneath the electron microscope, looking at the cellular structure of the wood. And every wood has a different structure, so they could they could tell me whether it was uh, whether it was cedar root or spruce root or vine maple or whatever. And when I split my roots, I I split them up and coil put them in little coils like this. All I got to do is throw that in a bucket of water, and and then I can weave with it. So this little basket here is. The it's probably the same weaver that wove these bigger ones, but it's. It's a. Uh, I think it was a child's basket made for, for a relative, probably. maybe picking little huckleberries in or something. So nothing's more human than a tiny kid's basket. <laughs> So we replicated these two types, these two major types, and, that, and that's Ed. This piece right down here was the large piece of the of the burden basket, the large one. Uh, 
like that, only only that large. <laughs> yeah. Be about this size. And uh, so it uh, it showed me the the side wall construction, the handle detail, the rim detail. So I was able to really replicate it very well by by that piece right there. And then the other piece on the other side is uh, a plating weave over and under weave. So I, so I was real proud of Dale. He he wove this one here, replicating the other uh, the other piece that was found. So That's why I know you need a form. You could not weave that kind of weave without working up a bent wood box or tapering. <laughs> So, and then that's, uh, I taken on an apprentice, Josh Mason there, and he uh, wove that large burden basket there. And uh, I've been teaching him, and then, uh, then in the lower picture, we wove uh, uh, shrimp, uh, uh, shrimp pot, uh, shrimp pot baskets and uh, some of our people went to the Smithsonian and at the Smithsonian they got this this shrimp pot basket that was collected in the Puget Sound area and so they took pictures of it so I was able to replicate it and weave one exactly like the one they have at the Smithsonian so the Smithsonian doesn't have anything over on me I got it. <laughs> but the bird, you know, a whole goal of this project is just to perpetuate this into the future generations of weavers in our area, Salish sea weavers. And um, the Burke Bill Home Center helped us reach that goal with Josh Mason, who's a Squaxin Island tribe uh, member. And uh, he was one of the t students. Uh, that you know, was supported by this Bill Holm grant for Ed to teach, that really took it on, the cedar lemon root style basket. Uh, and so he... Um, he uh, these, are, uh, these are all uh, the split cedar limb and, uh, and the split cedar root yeah, uh, barks. weavings. Josh uh, took his and he dropped it down 300 feet under the Puget Sound. <laughs> didn't tell us about it until it was over, but... <laughs> Put some cat food or some kind of, and caught a lot of shrimp. Caught okay. some, That's some of our, our big spotted shrimp we have up there. Works. So I know the basket works. <laughs> and uh, we've been getting a lot of support from the tribes for this book. They want this out for their future generations. Uh, Squats and Island Tribe, uh, the director and vice chair is showing Ed their beautiful museum at Squats and and then they gave us a grant to send, this just got sent out, I think, uh, uh, Monday to s all the libraries and uh, colleges in the Northwest with their, with, because they granted this, this sticker on it. So they wanted to get it out to the community. And then <coughs> these tribes, uh, Tulalip, Siletz, Snoqualmie, and uh, Suquamish, uh, funded a, um, subsidies for this book to make it less expensive for native weavers. So I got, um, I've got Dr. Uh, Habu, the form, if you're a Native American member and would like to get about half price for this book, it's through their subsidies, you can, you can get the book. So we got a lot of support from the tribes. That, that's probably our main audience. And this is what Ed was talking about. We've done, for 50 years, I've done archeological work in wet sites, including Ozette, you might have heard of, and. Ed's done 50 years of cultural training, and this is uh, when we were young bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, that's me where I lived, where I was raised in Indianola, the old house, and uh, my uh, grade school picture there. I don't know if you can spot me there. Anybody spot Ed? <laughs> Probably Kent. Uh, Kent, which one's that? <laughs> this is the test. And which one? Becca. Becca's a student from my wet site up at Squaxin, and uh, experimental so, uh, archaeologist. 
So uh, I feel, I still feel sorry for that teacher because <laughs> the, the first through the sixth grade, one room, one teacher. <laughs> so who is, who is it? <laughs> Nobody. Boy, they sure picked up on it at UBC. We gave a talk last. They knew right away. Yeah. <laughs> With his cousin there. And his first bike he got used for ten dollars, and in his high school picture. Oh. <laughs> And then this is Dale Crows in his high school picture, and, and Dale's first bike. <laughs> yeah, that bike would cost me $75, and I, I got commuted mine for to a pawn shop when I was 15 on that. I got I, uh, mine for 10 but it wasn't motorized. Formative motor professional <laughs> education started at that hawk shop. Wasn't motorized, though. <laughs> so you know which one's me? Pat probably knows. It's That's what you used to look like, I remember you <laughs> I'm the one with a Hopalong Cassidy t-shirt. Is that a good clue? <laughs> and I felt sorry for that. These teachers, too. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is where I live in Indianola, the red, uh, the red area there, the uh, uh, trust land. Uh, Native trust land that I, uh, Chief Wahaltchut up above and his wife Wiesedal. Uh, after we were run out of our, uh, our big house over in our old man house over in Suquamish, when the army took it over, was going to make a fort there, run out everybody out of it. And so they, they took Chief Wahaltchu over to Indianola because it was way far out of the way. <laughs> and so he, he had a 160-acre trust land given to him there. And so uh, that's, uh, I still, uh, it's still intact. Well, there's 80 acres now. Chief Wahaltchu quickly sold 80 acres off, but uh, so uh, I still hold it yeah, in, that in trust land. Picture that you have for this talk, he's sitting on his porch right there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, Chief Wahaltchu's uh, uh, personal cooking basket here. Uh, this was this one's about 200 years old, and of course the, the bottom has fallen out of it, but. Uh, there's little burn mark. They, they heated hot rocks and uh, hung them in the basket to draw, to boil food on. And they were, they were, they're called hard coil baskets because <laughs> see how hard, they just like a solid piece of wood once you, once you do this coiling weave. And uh, there's even little burn marks on the inside of this one. And I, uh, I replicated it. This. Don't hit it like that. <laughs> oh, you, you better show them. I replicated it. Uh, so this is my replication of it. So you can take a look at uh, at that there. This is his. Oh, that's my. Great uh, see, I was raised by my great grandma. Uh, my mom was too young when she had me, so she just gave me to my great grandma. So uh, that's why I was about 14 there. And uh, uh, she, uh, she's the one that uh, I watched weave these uh, clam gathering baskets. And uh, uh, so this particular uh, clam gathering, fish gathering basket was the one, the main one that our uh, Suquamish tribal people and Julia wove. She was one of the last weavers to, uh, to be weaving one of these cedar limb and cedar root baskets, or cedar bark, or no, cedar limb and, and cedar root baskets. And so I just fortunate enough to pick that up 
And when I was 14, I made my first one that I used for digging clams in and everything. So later on in life, I decided, well, I better uh, continue to weave these because if I don't, it's going to be a lost art. It's going to be, it's going to die out. So I've been weaving them. So I've been weaving them now for over 50 years. <laughs> we have this deed in the book, and it's the deed uh, to transfer this to Julia, his great grandmother from Chico Holtshu, and, and he couldn't read or write, so that's why they call it deed of lands of non-competent Indians. See, uh, they were. Uh, non-competent because they couldn't read or write, they just spoke Indian. And uh, so this old deed here with his thumbprint on the bottom, that's how they signed. And, uh, <coughs> and deeding the land over to Julia, his daughter, or his adopted daughter really, and, uh, and outside the house with some of her hard coil cooking baskets there and berry picking baskets. He wants to replicate this next. This one is beautiful actually. Yeah, it, it's in the museum. And one of, and me with one of those, uh, that's called a crossed warp basket. See the warps run, the, the warps are the body of the basket. And they cross over each other as, as you like weave up one. the basket. So they're called the crossed warp basket. We have his sales records from this. And these are traditional clam baskets. And we can estimate easily he's made 700 of these clam baskets out of lemon and red in his lifetime. <laughs> so it's one of his main focuses. And then uh, the, uh, the little basket that's going around there, the this is, this is uh, a couple of uh, hard coil baskets that I made and besides that one that's going around there and my... You sold that to the Burke maybe when Pat was director. <laughs> yeah, the Burke found out I was making that one so she called me up and wanted to buy it so I sold that one to the Burke and this one I still have. This one here is kind of a my lifetime story basket. It oh, it starts out with a with a fish net on the bottom, and my my canoe that I carved, and I used to hunt a lot of ducks, so I got some birds around there. And then, then I uh, got a salmon backbone design in there, and, and I got. Uh, Pick a hands and finger design and salmon gill design and I used to climb in the mountains so I got mountains and I like lightning streaks coming down and and uh, the moon and the stars and and the Milky Way up there. <laughs> so I, well, yeah, I just, this on his business card, yeah, his whole life story. This picture. I just uh, as I wove the basket, I designed it and put all those designs into it. Oh, this is my, uh, my generationally linked uh, basket weaving uh, compared to Dale Close's uh, archaeology or wet site generations way back. And uh, me with my son, Jeff, and my mother, Isabel, and my grandma, Agatha, and my great, and my great grandma, that, the lady that raised me. And so I, I was just real fortunate. I took, uh, I set my camera up and got in and took that yeah. picture. That's right out back of where we lived. We lived in that, okay. in that house there, and that was our, our smokehouse and our woodshed, and, and uh, so we we smoked a lot of that salmon in that smokehouse there. They did a studio picture right after this, a real formal studio picture, and we never could find it. We looked and looked, and then we found this, and this is better. This is much, <laughs> much better than the studio picture. <laughs> yeah. This is what Ed's talking about. We. 
we uh, were trying to figure out what we were doing, and we tended to call it generationally linked archaeology because these dots are each a generation for a hundred back to the 2,000-year-old baskets we were replicating. And you got Ed, and then his mom and grandmother didn't have the urge like he did to learn this, so <laughs> they never did, but he learned from Julia, who learned, you know, fourth, fifth generation wishy dot. And then I do this deep time, do statistics on these wet sites uh, in, in this whole area. And uh, I go from this direction, he goes from, his whole goal was to learn as far back uh, through the generations of weavers from museums and relatives. He never dreamed he would work with 100 generation <coughs> grandparents, you know, this. And, uh, and, and no doubt these were my relatives because we, uh, these tribes were relatively close together in the Puget Sound area, so we might have been related, you know. Yeah. You go 100 generations back in your Salish. It's, but this is where you live, right? Yeah. Or, and that's where the site is. So all of this is really interrelated basketry-wise for at least 3,000 years, or inside Salish Sea versus outside. And this shows the the cedar bark and cedar root bark. and tule and different fibers that these baskets were made out of and a majority of them were cedar root. Right, right here for and, the sea area. And uh, up north they were cedar bark yeah. and spruce Same root tree. and so forth. Emphasize the different parts of it. And, uh, then I worked at wet sites of Ozette out on the west coast with the Macaw tribe. And uh, this is uh, excavating the houses that were covered by a mudslide and we're using water to excavate. That's the first basket I ever found. It's like uh, Dr. Habu finding her, or Dr. Lightfoot finding her first arrowhead. But for me, <laughs> I knew my career. <laughs> and, uh, and we found these, uh, whalers hats too it's about 300 years old the the mudslide 1700 in fact when the the japanese recorded that tsunami coming clear across the pacific in seven in january 28th uh, 1700 and so there's they no could, earthquake that's why they call it an orphans so tsunami. they could tell us that the exact minute it happened when the when the tsunami hit japan they told us the exact minute that the, that the earthquake happened and the village was buried. But this, uh, this uh, 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 dome, onion dome hat here was uh, identified a whaler uh, or a chief, but it was definitely a whaler's hat because it was in the, in the Buried in the houses and the wet sites out there. And this one's spruce root. We made it all the spruce root. I made this one out of the spruce root with wild cherry bark and, a, and an ocean grass that floats in on the ocean beach and a bear grass here. So this is uh, just a two strand twining weave here that, uh, well, that I used. So we'll have to have Kent model it. Oh, well, you can kind of, <laughs> kind of look at that. Yeah, all the all of these artifacts, you know, were uh, part of the we're we're in equal partnership with the macaw, and, and one of their requirements is this never goes to Seattle to the Burke Museum or anywhere else. <laughs> and so we, uh, Dr. Richard Doherty, got funds through Jackson and Magnuson. Uh, to build a museum in Nam Bay, and some of you may have been there. Yeah, it's a gorgeous museum. So all the artifacts from this and the Hoka River site I dug with the macaw are up at Nam Bay, curated. And you want a little drink? I'm gonna. So I I did all these these tests to see, and I always got this sea area in the inside Salish Sea coming out. The first first one was uh, from all the baskets in '77. Whoops, 20 years later, I 
added in there a whole lot of baskets from Hoka River, this 3,000 year old site. Uh, and they have knob top hats 3,000 years ago there as well, which probably meant something about the wearer. But once you add that and you add water hazard, you increase, in, you know, you're trying to test your model. Or is there cultural continuity, um, cultural transmission through the styles of baskets? And it, it held up, and then another 20 years, we did uh, some more sites like Mud Bay, Quilquas, and, and added that to the test. So every 20 years I got to test my hypotheses, and they, they held up pretty well. Uh, so this is us working with the Squaxin Island tribe. And this is Ed. That's when we really got together. I started inviting him and said, you, we're getting clam baskets very much like yours. Uh, should, and he really wanted to come. So he, he's here uh, helping us excavate and, and see these clam baskets. <laughs> <laughs> and I got down there and, and that basket was so new looking underneath there had been under there for 700 years. And I said, Dale, did you just put that under there to fool me? <laughs> 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 I'm pulling his leg and I <laughs> Becca worked on our field school there and met Ed. Teach, he came up several times to teach the students about his work. Becca McKay and then I saw over in Exeter doing experimental archaeology. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, and uh, then uh, Akira Matsui, uh, who was a longtime friend of mine because he's a wet site archaeologist, sponsored this dig down in uh, Portland uh, with a different group of tribes, certainly the Salettes and Warm Springs and uh, Grand Ronde, that we found uh, beautiful uh, baskets. And, uh, and this is Pat Courtney Gold, who came down and helped us analyze this, knew exactly the material, knew exactly it was an acorn basket. She made me this and gave it to me, so I like wearing this, this frog, and, frog necklace. And one thing about that acorn basket, it's that crossed warp weave, yeah. that clam basket weave that's going around. And then we started doing cladistic analysis, which is more for biology, but to see if it complemented our close proximity analysis with uh, Dr. Mark Collard. And sure enough, this sea area really was polar opposite from the west coast here. And then uh, I was wanting to learn how to uh, weave with spruce root and make the uh, large burden basket back in the 1980s. And so I went to Nia Bay to McCall and I met uh, Isabel I did as well. She was already a, a great friend of my great grandma Julia. She actually used to come and stay at my house when I was really tiny. And they would go to Seattle area to pick hops and earn a few dollars that way. So I went up there and she took me to her spruce root gathering uh, along the ocean beach. These spruce roots grow in the sand. And we pulled all those nice long spruce roots out of the sand there. Like his hat. So generous, <laughs> and so that got me started the weaving the the backpack burden baskets, and then I uh, she said nobody makes these anymore. I don't know, and I said, well, Isabel, you help me out. I'll, I'll make you one for your hundredth birthday. <laughs> and, well, this was twenty years. <laughs> this was twenty years off yet, <laughs> you know. So by gosh, on her 100th birthday, I, I had it all made, and, and I went up there, and I'm uh, presenting it to her for her, for her 100th birthday there. And, and that's, when, that's when Dale Crows kind of uh, found out about me there. I couldn't believe anybody would. I knew the last weavers in, of these burden baskets. That, uh, so I, I had a, in 2000, I had my new digital camera, and I, these came out pretty good. They're in the book of Ed presenting this to someone who had been my teacher for 30 years. When I worked with the Macaw on the Ozette, we were equal partners and they, they, they said I had to take basket weaving from their elders to understand uh, the Ozette baskets and I didn't think so. I said, hey, <laughs> my director Dick Doherty said, uh, we're equal partners, you're gonna take a semester of that. 
So she, that's when she was my teacher. Uh, and uh, believe me, I learned more in that class than I would in any graduate class at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> right, kids? He knows. But I did. I, it was a real eye opener and it really led the way. And not only that, you know, to work with Ed, but. She's a best friend of Julius. <laughs> yeah, so, so we had that oh, nice connection. We had that link too. <laughs> and that, that, I couldn't believe. I, I, I really uh, <coughs> took notice when I saw him get about that basket. I'm really glad Dale was there to take that awesome picture. <laughs> and then yeah. this uh, <laughs> Kathleen here, she takes a little tiny speck and puts it underneath the microscope there and tells you whether it's uh, cedar root, spruce root, vine maple, or whatever, by looking at the cellular structure of the wood. See, that's blown up about oh, 10,000 times to to get one, one growth ring that big and look at the cellular structure of the wood there. Ed really likes looking into the, you know, this is the science side of it for Ed. He never looked inside of his spruce roots or cedar root. Or, and you see most of it at that 2,000 year old site is cedar root or a combination of root and land. So and here, and man, this is the site this is a dug by amateurs. And <coughs> This uh, on the Snoqualmie River, it flooded back in the 60s and, and these baskets were sticking out of the bank of the river there and somebody, somebody was going up the river and noticed them. So these amateur archaeologists got in there and rescued all these beautiful pieces, rescued about 60 pieces. And most of those are preserved in the Burke Museum now, and and so that's if they hadn't why done it, we wouldn't have them to do this. Probably. That's so why I was able to uh, to replicate the that particular burden basket there off of these pieces that were found here in the blue clay there, and as Ed passed around that replica, and there's no oxygen in that. There's, you know, the brown color of soil is because it's, you know, it, the, the iron rusts. Well, there's no oxygen, it's blue still, and, and bacteria, fungus can't operate. So these baskets, there's some <coughs> sites in the Charlottes that are 10,700 years old with spruce root braids. It's not part of our learning tradition in archaeology, but, uh, nor is basketry, but uh, it's, it, it, you know, very much supported by tribes because 90% of their material culture comes back to light in these kinds of sites. And, uh, so we went to UBC, we were just there, and that was a real eye opener for Ed and I because we got to see even older baskets from the mm -hmm. Fraser Delta. The 2,000 year old ones were identical to beater boasts. And uh, I just got to show your <coughs> samples too. Oh yeah. I just got one little guy made here from that 4,500 year old weave. And boy, that, yeah. of all the weaves, I've never seen a weave like this. Any basket I've ever looked at in all the museums and everything, I've never seen this weave yet. And I prefer that, I really <laughs> like this weave here. <laughs> He's, it's just he's the, used that body <laughs> weave in his, in his traditional clam baskets today. And I, I and, made a clam basket. <laughs> I made a clam basket using that particular weave. That's a miniature of the 3,000, and I'll show you the 4,000. This is the 4,500 year old. And he made samples of those, and we need these. No, oh, these little, these little guys here are the 3,000 and and then the regular weave that they do. Yeah, 3,000 and 4,500. He first made these samples before he did the archaeology basket. We showed you when I first. Get, <clears throat> when I get old timers, I just have to look at those, then I won't forget how to, weave, <laughs> how to do that weave. See, <laughs> look at those and that, samples. And the UBC bought this basket. It's on display now in, in their museum. <clears throat> it shows you the 
different layers of time. So he decided to call it an archaeology basket. And uh, that's his dog, uh, or neighbor's dog, Charlie. <laughs> That's his beach on the end of that allotment. He probably yes, has the only allotment still with a native allotment with a beach. Yeah. So, anyway, some of you archaeologists, well, we were wondering, what is this? What are we doing? That, is it experimental archaeology? And it really isn't, according to John Cole, who's quite involved with this in wetland sites. It's not exactly reproducing circumstances, conditions. So it's not really experimental archaeology, Becca. But and it's not really ethnoarchaeology since uh, it does involve, you know, working with Ed and trying to understand a site in the past, but that isn't really what we were trying to do with that Beaterbow site. We were trying to see, you know, the generations of weaves, how they connected to his generations. And so we call it generationally linked archaeology, where we work with a current artisan and archaeological evidence. Now you have to make this available to the artisans uh, so that they can do this and we got to realize that as scientists they got to get in like today we got into the museum uh, back room here uh, at the Hearst Museum and uh, and I've always found that it it without question you can give a basket S Isabel is 3,000 years old and she knows exactly she can make it she knows the material she knows what it's used for that knowledge is still here. It, I think you could do that with pottery in other parts of the world where it's real common. If you really work with the artisans from the communities in the Southwest, you could probably take it back through the archaeology and that'd be generationally linked archaeology. <clears throat> so we put this together and uh, have our hypothesis and we think it's valid. It could be tested some more of this generationally linked archaeology. And uh, it is experimental archaeology, but a different kind. Uh, we also uh, were able to see if this was well accepted around the world in different places and SAAs. And uh, so we got an invitation from Dr. Habu to go work with the Ainu. So we, uh, here's Ed with his spruce roots from Hoko River mouth. Uh, but we both read this Ainu book. Uh, <laughs> from the whole thing, you know, uh, by uh, uh, Fitzhugh, right? Bill Fitzhugh. And, uh, and then I read Junko's classic book, seminal book on ancient Jamon, Japan, and really got ready. And then we went from Salish Sea to Ainu and had a wonderful experience uh, visiting there. This is uh, Dr. Habu and they really do have some pretty neat work, you know, internships. We talk about uh, Josh working with Ed. Well, they do like three-year internships, correct? So we went to many of these centers. So this young lady is working and these, and then they learn language, dance, song, loom work, basket, three years, you know, so our, our Indian colleges don't quite do that. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry again. Can oh, I don't know. I don't know who. Fu I don't know who funds it. We paid our way over. <laughs> I mean, we did because we offered. We were so excited. We were happy to do that. And then from there on, it was taken care of by uh, Dr. Habu's gang. <laughs> and these are. Uh, pump lines from a wet site in Japan. They got lots of wet sites. We don't do that. And I guarantee you, you got in the bay here in those shell mains, you, you, you looked, you'd find a waterlogged part of that. Because I've seen them at Clear Lake with cordage hanging out of the bank. If you looked, you know, you know we just don't do that. We don't learn to do that in our uh, profession yet. <laughs> but this is a Japanese pump line and one we found at Kukwas Mud Bay that had is modeling here, but he makes the, he, when we found it that day, he was there, and you might have been there, Becca, and he had his tump line and showed our students, this is what that is. Great workshops. <laughs> I, uh, uh, that Japanese uh, bamboo weaver came oh, yeah. to, uh, to, uh, 
show me about bamboo weaving. And then uh, the reporter was there, and, and the next day I was on the front page of the Japanese newspaper. <laughs> but this is Koichi, one of the Ainu elders, that uh, was very impressed by how we could work together. Uh, he's a, a tree farmer. You want to say something about him? Oh, yeah, I was really, really happy to meet him because he, he raises different trees on his property there and and I'm a tree farmer I raise my own trees on my property you oh. need a tree farm really to do <laughs> you need a forest to do basketry yeah so he's oh. very fortunate to have his own the, we saw these dugouts from down here out of redwoods but look at the Ainu dugouts kind of similar in Kweechee yeah the Ainu canoes were very similar to so Dr. Hubu is taking three of these books over for Koichi and other friends we met there. And we saw some of the Jamal museums, but Ed got to help them quite a bit with their ancient baskets. They didn't know quite everything about the cedar bark baskets he was able to explain because he makes them. <coughs> and that's what you're talking about there, Ed. Oh, yeah. That's Ed or... Carrier right there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he's learning from this master bamboo weaver. He really liked it. He really enjoyed it. And then this is a replica of a 7,000 year old book at uh, Himagashu. What's the name of this site? That's up in Kyushu down south. Higashimyo. Yeah? Higashimyo. Yeah, Higashimyo. Mm -hmm. But those are 7,000 year old baskets. <laughs> I can't hear you. I always hated taking roll in class because I'm awful with names. But anyway, these are an acorn pits just like we found in Sunken Village at Portland. So that's why the Japanese crew sponsored us to do that dig. It's a National Historic Landmark site, but we couldn't get any federal people to even be interested, but the Japanese sponsored it. The tribes took notice of that. They thought that was perfect. So then, <clears throat> this uh, this fellow here, Bruce Miller, he's, uh, I think he brought it out in that statement, uh, what does the maker of a basket want you to know? And the fact that artists like the basket maker might be the only uh, conduit the only link uh, to to this information in the past, so uh, so of which Coast Salish people today uh, remain connected to the to the ancestors by uh, by these baskets that were found in these wet sites, and, and when I'm uh, when I'm weaving those baskets, I I can almost feel the presence uh, the their hands helping my hands uh, weave a nice looking, uh, uh, figure out the weave and weave a nice looking basket. So, <laughs> so this is the whole Salish, it's a book, you know, it's sort of like the layers of the whole Salish identity for 4,500 years. How many of us can look at that and say that sort of thing? So we got the, we got the uh, Peace and Friendship Award, uh, the Washington State Historical uh, uh, Peace and Friendship Award, and uh, uh, the uh, the Thomas Jefferson Medal was designed to when Lewis and Clark came out west, why they had that medal to to give to the Native, the Indian people as they met them coming out, so that Peace and Friendship Award. But, but you have to be working together. You have to be a Native, working with a non-Native uh, to uh, be qualified to get that award. So my son was always teasing me, oh, you had to work with a, <laughs> you had to work with a white man to get that award, huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, it's kind of says for promoting the diversity of Washington State that the person who wrote the nomination is uh, uh, <coughs> is uh, <coughs> Barbara here, who's uh, Suquamish, his tribe, head of the chair, elders chair uh, committee. But she said they're spreading diverse, you know, the promoting the diversity of Washington around the world to the Ainu and everyone. Oh, and, uh, this is their chair, uh, Leonard Forsman of Suquamish. The That's fat a, one, no, I mean. Yeah. That well, that, uh, oh, that picture there, uh, that's where I do my weaving in my home yeah, there. Now, uh, you might, uh, I just brought this little basket for curiosity because it, yeah. it relates to fishing, it relates to whaling. That black piece on the wall there, that's a baleen plate out of a big bowhead whale up whale in Alaska. And a fella, a, another basket weaver friend of mine challenged me to weave a, a baleen basket out of that plate so I was able to cut strips and and, stri and split them down and, and weave this little baleen basket so I thought I'd, I'd bring that. <laughs> and, uh, but that, those were woven up in Alaska. Uh, by the natives up there. And uh, that weaving came into being when, uh, when the bandsaw came in uh, because that plate you can only uh, bandsaw it into the quarter inch strips. And then once you get those bandsawed out, then you can, then you can split it uh, uh, lengthwise, um, otherwise you can't you can't split it uh, without band sawing the quarter inch pieces out. So, <laughs> so then they started making these beautiful baleen baskets up there back in the old, probably the early, right at the turn of the century, the early 1900s, and so. You know, it's probably the best thought I ever had in my life. I was reassessing those 2000 old bass, and I thought, why don't I ask Ed Carey or challenge him to make those two? <laughs> I do. He would just be biting at the bit to do it. You know, he, he, he's that kind of personality. And that was the best idea ever in my life, and that made my retirement path. So. <laughs> but thanks. Is there any? Then, but we would certainly take questions and. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious about the um, the weaving, the, the basket that you found uh, up in Canada that was what 3,000, 4,000 yeah. years old. You said yeah, that you had not seen that pattern before. Yeah. Yeah. Was that just one piece, maybe the production of one weaver, or was did you find several pieces so? That was a pattern used by that Well, that site has very few baskets. Most of these in that test have at they least just, 60, 80, 100. Yeah. Um, they, that one didn't, but I that's think they just the oldest found, we yeah. have. And it's a big piece. I think they just found the one piece. Yeah. Uh, so it might have been just that, that was, one person, that yeah, one artist that made that. That's it there, uh, but it's big. You know, it's a it's huge yeah. piece of peck basket. It's a large Thanks now. piece. <laughs> Glad you could come. Glad I caught Got a hold of you. Yeah, so. Uh, Other questions? Yeah, so you guys are you're both talking about the forest with the cedar mm -hmm. and some of the other trees. Obviously, you're using different parts of that, you know, to make the baskets. So how much management does that entail? Do you, I mean, are they just on their own, or do you... Do you actually go out there and do you prune them? Do you take care of those trees? And is that something that's long lived up there in the in the Washington area? I didn't quite. I don't hear very well. It's, so it's the management of the trees. Oh yeah. You know and, and yeah. just how, yeah. how in order to really get the kind of roots and other yeah. What do you do to do that? And how do, do you, you get think that, good? Do you think good. that that has well, I, antiquity? Yeah, I try to manage the forest there and plant little cedar trees, and uh, but I try to 
I try to plant them in a sandy area. Uh, roots in a in a hard soil are just too crooked, and but if this tree grows in a nice sandy hill, you'll get nice long straight roots. <laughs> and so I, I try to plant these trees and oh trees that I planted uh, eight years ago now are up and I can actually harvest little cedar limbs off of the bottom of those right right now and use them in the in the smaller baskets yeah. and of course so and you know that when it comes to taking any of these pickly bark and other things yeah. uh, the, you have to ask that tree. It has a consciousness. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, it has yeah. A soul kind of thing. And, and Native way it has is a the different management than clear cutting without ever saying boo, you know. And <coughs> so. Native way is to you come up to the tree and you say a few prayers and ask it to, uh, to give up a, a root or a limb and show respect to the tree before you go and uh, start digging around. And, but, but the root of the tree, uh, the main root goes out and then these feeder roots come off of it, searching for nutrients. And they'll just go all over. So that's the root, uh, they go out there and dig and find those feeder roots. And, and they lead me up to the main route, and so I prune those off, and right away it's like pruning a fruit tree. They sprout a new, they sprout a new one and start growing again. So you, so you never hurt hurt the tree by harvesting a root, a root off of it, or the, or the limb too. The limb it, it can sprout a new limb there too. They have to be, I mean, the botanists. But the it's, uh, all the things, I mean, we yeah. say science and culture. Sure. It's, uh, biologist. it's pulling the bark off the tree that bothers me. I, I can't bring myself to, uh, pull a piece of bark off the tree because hmm. that injures the tree for the rest of its life. So, so I always look for down trees and or places that are going to be logged. Uh, before I gather my uh, my cedar bark. That has a question. Can I just have a comment? Uh, Jill, I think while you're down here, you need to take Lightfoot out around the bay because obviously he's missed these important <laughs> websites. That, uh, that basket tree, so. I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. I've missed a lot of things, but yeah, I think you have to drink. i got a couple different places out there. Look over the uh, landscape. He can say what he wants you to retire. <laughs> Brought a couple other items here. This is a this is a canoe baler made out of a a, a piece of cedar bark, uh, wet down and folded, and put this little handle on, and they could just throw the water out of the out of the canoe with a little uh, a little canoe baler like this. And then I. Uh, I was digging up on the property and I hit this stone and this this chip broke off of it and these ancient clams were in there. Uh, I no doubt these clams are millions of years old. <laughs> uh, and they look just like our steamer clams only they're only they're long and skinny uh, rather than round. Our steamer clams are kind of round. Oblong, oblong shape, uh, but these are long and skinny clams. <laughs> and then uh, when our people uh, uh, wove a fishnet out of maybe uh, nettle fiber cordage, and then they, they tied up a little anchor rock they found a crotch in a tree and they found a rock on the beach and and they cut some wild cherry bark and bound it there 
then they could tie these along the bottom of their net for a, for a lid line <laughs> that we have today. So, if you had found that in a non waterlogged site, either we find them in the 3000, 2000, all you find is that pebble, and you wouldn't think it was anything. Yeah. You just wouldn't ask. Can I ask you a question about net netting, making netting? Uh, like you talked about the baskets needing a frame. <laughs> So you want to see a little bit? Yeah, I'll get you a drink there. You talked about the baskets making a frame. Do, do you think the people may had some kind of a, ga a gauge to make netting, or do you think it was just done like you make your baskets just by eye? Uh, they had this little gauge. Uh, they, they carved this little net, uh, and they could put their cordage in it. Yeah. And then when we, when they released one one uh, length. And tied their knot, then you know, the net was a was a gauge, depending on how big that uh, that net needle was. And was that made of wood? Do you think? And that was made out of a hardwood, yeah, hardwood. that they carved like a. Some specialists in nettles too. Nettle like fiber. Like a used wood. It makes it strong. really strong. And I'm sure the Anglo name nettle comes from a connection with net making. And I really, I really prefer the nettle fiber to dog bane or, uh, or the, uh, um, oh, the, the fireweed uh, stem too. But nettle fiber is really, uh, really super stuff to work with. It peels off real easy and really strong. Can I ask you one more question about net gauges? Could they have been used bone, like um, like a rib from a, a, a large fish or an animal, a deer or something? Do you ever see any evidence of using a rib bone, or a bone, I should say, for a net gauge? Or is it always just a, a, a thin piece of hard wood? Uh. I don't know. Uh, Archaeologically? I don't think I, so. I don't remember any. You know, in wet sites, you do find little wooden squares that were gauges just to make sure your, you know, your, your knot uh, distance was correct. And those are made of wood? Wooden, yeah. yeah wooden. Wooden. There's a lot of things for wooden, wooden we never see. Yeah. But that isn't possible. I mean, you certainly could take a bone and get a gauge and then just it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember. Sorry, are the baskets sewn with like a large needle, a uh -huh. large gauge needle, to actually do the weaving? No, weaving? the basket. Yeah, all, all for the yeah. hard basket. No, yeah. the baskets are all hand woven. Completely hand. You know, with your with your fingers, and, and but a, but a hard coil basket. Uh, Water you have to have an awl, okay. and you poke yeah, a hole. Cannon, you poke a hole through the bottom coil, and bring your wave around and put it in there, yeah. and then you pull the top coil tight against the bottom coil, mm -hmm. and then the, once you do that, you're actually uh, forming a solid piece of wood that'll hold water. <laughs> Thank you.